using DNA barcoding to create a phylogenetic tree. Hello, my name is Ajley Donnelly. I have always been interested in genetics, and when I mentioned this to my mentor, Dr. Jan Chalepny, she recommended I research and experiment with DNA barcoding. DNA barcoding is using a short sequence of DNA called a barcode to identify an unknown sample. The idea is that, just as all items in a store have a unique barcode, so do all species. This concept is extremely successful for animal species. All animals contain the CO1 locus, or cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1, which codes for mitochondrial protein. The sequence of this locus has enough variation between different species that every species sequence is unique, making it ideal to isolate as a barcode. For plants, however, no one locus has been identified that contains enough variation between species to be used universally as a barcode. Often, a trial and error approach must be taken to isolate a barcode from an unknown species, meaning multiple tests must be conducted on the sample before one is successful, making the process highly unreliable. It is for that reason I chose to experiment with isolating multiple loci, or different gene locations, to be used to create a barcode. It was my belief that, by combining genetic information from different loci, there would be enough variation between species to accurately identify unknown samples. After extensive research, my mentor and I decided I would experiment with the loci RBCL and MACK-K. RBCL is the name of the Rubisco large gene, which is a part of the chloroplast DNA which codes for Rubisco, a necessary enzyme that fixes carbon during photosynthesis. All land plants must go through photosynthesis to create energy to live, therefore it would be present in all land plants. From previous research, it was known that RBCL had been found to have significant variability at the family level of classification. It therefore would not be enough on its own for a DNA barcode. MACK-K is matrace K, an intron, or a segment of DNA between genes, in chloroplast DNA. From previous research, it was known to have significant variability at the species level of classification. In combination with RBCL, the species of the sample would be able to be found and compared against the family identification to check validity. In order to not overcomplicate the project, I chose to use grasses as my experimental subjects. I made this decision because the experiment was conducted during winter, so grass was one of the few land plants growing at the time, and there are many species of grass native to Washington. I collected three samples from different areas of three different parks, one in the suburbs, one by a lake, and one along the Puget Sound, for a total of nine samples in order to increase my chances of collecting different species. The procedure for this experiment included multiple separate steps. I began my experiment by first isolating the DNA of each sample. Once the DNA was isolated, it was run on a gel electrophoresis in order to check that DNA had been successfully extracted. If the isolation of DNA was successful, a bright band would be visible. As you can see in these pictures of the gels, all samples had DNA successfully extracted. The DNA was then prepared to run through a polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to amplify the target sequence of DNA. This meant that many copies of the target sequence were made to be used for sequencing. Two different PCRs were run, one for RBCL and one for MACK-K, so two sets of samples had to be prepared. DNA from each sample was combined with its corresponding primer set, either RBCL or MACK-K. After being amplified, the samples were run through another gel electrophoresis in order to check that the primer sets had properly annealed to the DNA, meaning the primer sequences were able to bind to the DNA sequences to be copied. If DNA of the RBCL primer set was successful, a bright band would appear around 0.6 kilobases as well as an additional band lower on the gel, which is primer dimer, or leftover primer that did not anneal to the DNA. As you can see in these gels, samples L2, L3, S1, S2, S3, O1, O2, and O3 were successful, but sample L1 was not. An anomaly, however, was that the negative control had an additional band, not just primer dimer, meaning DNA was present and there should not have been any. This error could have occurred for multiple reasons, such as experimental error. If annealing of the MACK-K primer set was successful, a bright band would appear around 0.8 kilobases in addition to the primer dimer. As you can see in these gels, L2, S1, S2, S3, O1, O2, and O3 were successful, but samples L1 and L3 were not. For this run, an error occurred with the positive control because the only band to appear was the primer dimer. Again, this could have been an experimental error. Although these errors occurred, the sample's bands appeared at the expected length, so I continued forward in my experiment and prepared them for sequencing. For those that were successful, the samples were cleaned using a purchased cleanup kit. The purpose of cleaning or purifying the DNA was to concentrate the amplified sequence so more accurate reading could be determined by removing excess primer. The samples were then sent to Eurofin Genomics to be sequenced, meaning the sequence of bases was read and recorded. When returned, sequences had five base possibilities, 
A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, C for cytosine, and an N for bases that were not able to be determined. Each base is also given a quality value based on the reliability of the base identification. Sequences were then trimmed using the program Finch TV. Trimming required eliminating base information from the ends of all the sequences due to their low quality readings or inability to be determined, which made identification more accurate. The sequences were then run through basic local alignment search tool BLAST and compared to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, NCBI, database. The matching sequences identified which family or species the sample belonged to. The comparisons between the known and unknown sequences would show how many and where differences occurred, if any, which was made visible by a red letter appearing rather than a dot. For the seven samples that were able to be sequenced, there were varying degrees of success. While they were all identifiable, the accuracy of those identifications is unknown without repeating the procedure. BLAST was also used to create a phylogenetic tree by comparing the sequences of the samples to one another. The phylogenetic tree showed the relationship of the different samples to one another based on their sequences and how many matching bases they contained. Those relationships were then able to confirm the identifications of each species that was found in the previous step, providing additional data to support the sample's classifications. Due to the lack of information from the two samples that were unable to be sequenced, they were not able to be identified or added to the phylogenetic tree, although the family L3 belonged to was identified on the basis of the RBCL code sequence. After analyzing the results, the evidence refutes the hypothesis. Only seven of the nine samples were able to be identified due to an inability of the loci to be isolated from all samples, meaning they are not sufficient to be used to isolate both barcodes of all plant species. Although these tests would need to be run again to check for error, the results show RBCL and MATK are not effective loci. Different primers still need to be used in combination with them. To continue this research, tests will be run with primer sets for TRNH, PSBA, and PSBM TRND. These loci are also known for containing variability between species. Hopefully, the genetic information isolated from them in combination with the evidence from the loci RBCL and MATK will be sufficient to identify all samples.